Well, we're continuing our series in Micah, and this week we're going to wrap up chapter 6. Just as a reminder, we talk about this each week, but Micah's name means who is like God. And the point of this book is that there is no one like God. But the problem is the people of that time are just like the people of our time, and they tended to put lots of things at the center of their lives to replace God, to stand in the place that God should should hold in their lives and in their community. The leaders of the Jewish people were especially guilty of idolatry. Their idolatry was in the form of worshiping wealth and power. What was interesting that we saw last week is that last week, it was the entire community of people who were being addressed, not just the leaders. It was all of the people who struggled with this type of idolatry. This week, we're going to see the consequences of that. Their lives will be marked by futility, by the futility that they have caused others. Now... Quick quiz, age check, whatever you want to call this. Who here knows the reference, resistance is futile? Outstanding, I'm impressed, you are all my friends. Um, It is from Star Trek, The Next Generation. And um, there was a particular bad guy, bad guys, bad culture, called the Borg. They were not Swedish. Um, The Borg were these kind of half robot, half organic material creatures that would sweep into a planet and they would just take over that entire planet. And their uh, way of announcing their presence as to what they were going to do and how they were going to turn everyone into the planet into Borg just like them, was to say resistance is futile. And if you watch the show, it was actually very chilling. It was chilling for a couple of reasons. One is these creatures were just soulless. And what they were talking about doing was turning everyone on this, on this planet into soulless creatures just like them. And they would say that line with such a flat, even confidence that you knew, you felt for these characters that their situation was absolutely hopeless. There is nothing that they could do about that. Unless they were on the Enterprise, and then they could solve the problem. (laughs) I think it's also chilling because futility is a very frightening idea in our culture. It brings up thoughts of wasted time, wasted effort, wasted resources, even a wasted life. It drains us of our hope. I spoke with someone recently who was really frustrated with some dynamics that were going on in his family. And he was tired of again and again and again having conversations that led nowhere. Nothing that he did could snap them out of the negative cycle that they were in. And so he had a whole bunch of what's the point questions. What's the point of one more conversation? What's the point of one more trip to see these relatives? What's the point of all this emotional energy that I'm expending? It seems absolutely hopeless. It's futile. I talked with someone else recently who was experiencing something similar at work. They worked incredibly hard, great reviews, small company. And after years of excellent work, there just were not opportunities anymore for growth, financially or professionally. And the company just seemed happy to bleed him dry of everything that he could give, but they did not give much back. And he got to the point where his work seemed futile. And he had what's the point questions. What's the point of working overtime? What's the point of trying for excellence? 
What's the point of sacrificing so much for my family? And in Micah 6, we enter into a passage that looks at people who are creating this kind of futility for others. And ultimately, what God says is you're going to experience this kind of futility yourselves. Now, again, a reminder for the overview of the book of Micah. Micah is divided into three different cycles. And each cycle follows the same pattern. It starts in judgment. Then there's evidence for why this judgment is coming. But then the cycle will end with a word of hope. Micah 6 starts the third cycle. And what we saw last week is it starts the third cycle with God filing a lawsuit against his people. And this week, we're going to see the verdict from the lawsuit. And the verdict is all about futility. It starts in verse 9. We're actually going to pick it up in verse 10 with the futility that people gave to others. Now, verse 10 gives us a picture of a house that is filled with treasures. It's a sort of house that you look at and say, by all outward appearances, the people who live here are a success. Look at what they've accumulated. It's a testimony to having arrived, but God gives a very different judgment on it. God says, this is not a testimony of having arrived. This is a testimony of wickedness, of evil. It talks about a scant measure, and that's a way of saying that these people who lived in this house cheated people out of their money. And so God looks at them and says, you are accursed. This home is not a picture of wealth. It is a picture of evil. And it is a picture of a type of evil that God says, I reject categorically. Verse 11 goes into more detail as to how they were cheating the people. It talks about wicked scales and deceitful weights. You see, this is primarily an agricultural agrarian society. And so the way things were valued and the way that things worked in the marketplace all had to do with how much things weighed. So to give an obvious example, let's say you have three pounds of apple pie. That is clearly, without question, worth more than two pounds of apple pie. But if you could figure out a way to make someone pay for three pounds of apple pie, but only give them two and a half pounds, you could pad your profit margin and you could have a lot of leftovers for me. Well, that's what they're saying is going on. That's how these people are getting rich. They're manipulating the marketplace to, treat, to cheat the customers. And God's point in verse 11 is that he is not going to treat what they are doing. He's not going to say about what they are doing. He's not going to think about what they are doing as if it is okay. And then verse, seven, verse 12 takes up the intensity another notch. The word for violence means they used aggressive physical action. It's a word that would have included murder. In other words, these people will use lies and physical attacks to get what they want. It's like verses 11 and 12 are describing the mafia. These people will lie, they will cheat, they will steal, they will murder to enrich themselves and get what they want. I call this section futility given because that is actually what is being created in the lives of the people that they are cheating. I mean, think about that. If you get cheated like this, when your life depends on your ability to buy and sell crops, eventually you're not going to be able to feed your family. You're not going to be able to feed your livestock. You're going to lose your business. You're going to lose the ability to just purchase the basic things of life. All that work that went into the farming, into the ranching, into caring for the home, into being careful with money, all of that is going to seem futile because you're getting blood dry just little by little. Nothing that you've done to provide for your family is going to feel like it is accomplishing anything, and it's going to feel hopeless. As working through this passage, I was trying to think through how is it that we do this to people today? 
right? We're not usually in a position to, manipul to manipulate weights and scales and determine how much someone pays for something that way. But we do have ways that we do it. We have ways that can make someone else's efforts feel like they are absolutely futile. Right? How often do we make people feel like nothing they do is good enough? I had an employee years ago in Dallas. Literally every morning, it was clockwork. I would see her walk into the large room where my office was, and the first stop she would make would be at my office. And the first stop she would make, the reason she would make this stop would be to complain about something that she had noticed the day before that she didn't like. And it was usually really stupid stuff. I wrote some things down. Wouldn't it be so much more convenient if the drinking fountain were closer? Think about how much more efficient we would be if we had two copiers. Okay, I get it. I know that. What do you think we're going to do about that today? Not, do you really think we're going to move the drinking fountain? That's not going to happen. I started to feel, I mean, this is silly, but when this happens every single day, you start to think like, there is nothing that anyone can do to make this workplace successful and appealing to you. There is nothing. It felt like every single day we were starting the day with a new failure and there was nothing that could be done to fix it. Silly example, but it is a reminder of how much our negativity creates a sense of futility around us. There are many ways that we try to enrich ourselves emotionally and try to create frustration and futility in others. Right? We make ourselves feel better emotionally with a condescending remark to someone. And they feel like their efforts at a healthy mutual relationship are futile. We post a scathing comment on Facebook and boy, we feel smarter. but we, treat, we cheat people out of the dignity of an open, honest conversation. We shut people out of our lives. Maybe we feel safe, but we cheated them out of the closeness that they want. See, Micah's audience enriched themselves by frustrating the best efforts of the people around them. They made the efforts that these people had to build a life seem hopeless and futile. And God responds in verse 13 by saying, enough. And what he's going to do is he will make sure that they receive the same futility that they have given to others. Verse 13, God's response to the people inflicting futility on others is he's going to do the same to them. They have this word that says, grievous blow. Literally, the Hebrew is, I will make the striking of you sick. What a vivid way of saying that. These people made others sick with worry and fear because they couldn't get fair payment for their work. And that means it was hard for them to care for their family and to just function in life. And as a result, God is going to make these people sick of a grievous blow. It's he's saying that he is going to make them a desolate people as a result. They will be like they are cut off from life. Like the way they live and where they live is going to be an uninhabitable desert. God is going to take and strip these people of the very things that they have been holding on to. Verse 14 starts a series of descriptions of normal things that people do, followed by how the usual expected result isn't going to happen. The people are going to eat, but they're still going to have gnawing hunger inside. 
The people are going to put produce aside for future use, but that produce is going to go bad, and what doesn't go bad is going to be taken by enemies. And then verse 15 focuses on the three main products of the land that were so critical in their society. They will sow grain, but there will be no harvest. That means there will be no flour for bread, a very staple that they would need every single day. They will make olive oil, but not be able to use it. Olive oil was used for cooking. It was used for light. It was used for medicine. It would be an incredible hardship to not have olive oil. The people will make wine, but they will not be able to drink it. Wine was a normal daily drink. It was a staple for them as well because this is a land where water is scarce and what water there is is often impure. Verse 15 highlights the very things that people needed for daily life, food, drink, medicine, and God says that the people will work hard for these daily needs, but it's not going to do any good. Whatever the people try to produce, whatever the people try to acquire, whatever the tree people try to hoard away, it is not going to satisfy them. They are going to experience the same futility that they have inflicted on others. You even get a hint from verse 14 of how it's going to happen, that an enemy is going to come in and take this all from them. When I first read that, my initial reaction was, great, these people are going to get what they deserve. But I'm not sure that's really the reaction that Mike is going for. I think what he wants is for the people to see that a life given in pursuit of acquiring, accumulating, and self-satisfaction will never give them what they want. Mike is not taunting them. Mike is giving them a warning. Think back a year or two ago when you were little. Do you remember how life was going to be good once you got a certain Christmas present? Do you remember how life was going to be good once you got into a certain college or started a certain career? Do you remember how life was going to be good once you got out of that college or out of that career? Do you remember how life was going to be good once you married a certain person or started your family? We're just like the people of Micah's time. We are always looking for something that we can produce or acquire, whether it's material or a relationship or an accomplishment, that will make life good. And if that is what we build the foundation of a good life on, Micah's word to us is that it is going to end not in the good life, but the feudal life. A bank account, a career, a relationship can only go so far in giving us the sense of purpose and value and security that we are desperately longing for. Eventually, they're going to let us down like everything in a fallen world does. And once again, we will feel like all of the effort was futile. Another way of saying that is that God is not in the business of reaffirming the things in our lives that we put in his place. God is not in the business of reaffirming the things in our lives that we put in his place. Micah's audience enriched themselves by frustrating the best efforts of the people around them, and God responds by promising to make their lives futile in the same way. But verses 9 and 16 actually give the way out because they highlight the cause of the feudal life. The passage is bookended by these two verses because they're set up to contrast one another. And the contrast is in whom the people listen to. In verse 9, they're called to listen to the Lord. Fearing the name of the Lord means to respect his authority, to live according to his commands and statutes, to take seriously what he says and let what he says guide your life. The last part of this verse is very hard to translate, and some of your Bibles are going to disagree on how to translate it, but this seems to be what's going on. The word that's translated rod in this translation probably refers to a tribe, 
So it's probably referring to a staff that was used by a leader to lead a tribe or lead a group of people. And the word that's translated appointed probably refers to an assembly. So it's this, this group that has been appointed to come together as an assembly. And the idea of verse 9 is this, that the people are to gather together and listen to what the Lord says, and then they are to follow it. By the way, one of the ways that we fulfill that is what we're doing right now. If what we do is leave here and follow it. Verse 16 is the other part of the bookend. It's a contrast with verse 9. Here the picture is of the people following wicked, evil leaders. Omri and Ahab were very important kings of the northern tribe of Israel about 100 to 150 years before Micah. Ahab was actually Omri's son. And what's interesting is Omri's family held the throne of that northern kingdom of Israel longer than any other family. But they were infamous for being incredibly, incredibly wicked. Micah is telling them that they are walking by the principles and advice of two of the most wicked leaders in history. And when it says that they kept their statutes, it is saying that they were careful, they were intentional to follow Omri and Ahab. It's like these people are constantly going to the bookstore and buying biographies on Omri and Ahab. They're going to the management section, and they're finding leadership by Omri, and they're buying it. They're going to the self-help section, and they're finding Ahab's guide to having it all, and they're buying it, and they're living by it. These people are working hard to follow wicked leadership. And the result of working so hard to follow that culture that's been created is that the nations around them will hiss at them. It's the idea of a hiss like you're booing a horrible performance at a football game for an unnamed team. And the people around them are going to scorn God's people because God's people are working so hard to be just like the worst spiritual examples in their history. The contrast between the two verses really comes down to who is shaping Micah's audience. Who is shaping the people? They're either listening to the Lord's voice or they're listening to the voice and counsel of a culture that has turned its back on God. And the reason the people acted the way they did in verses 10 through 12 of stealing and manipulating is because they were becoming just like their culture. Let me give you an example of how this plays out in my life. The issue for me is where does my value come from as a person? Where does the culture say my value comes from? Our culture says my value comes from my output from what I contribute, what I accomplish, what I achieve. And I am constantly tempted to listen to that voice. And when I listen to it, I find myself that I fight hard to earn my value through what I do. And so I overwork to improve my output. I get stingy because I want to ensure that I have enough to, approve, to prove my value. I'm tempted to take too much credit for something because I want others to think more highly of my contributions. What am I doing? I am living out verse 16. I am walking in the counsel of a culture that says, I am only as valuable as my contributions. And if I fall deeper and deeper into that thinking, life is going to become futile. Why? Because I can never contribute enough. My accomplishments yesterday don't count today. I have to keep buying people's approval through what I achieve. It is just like what is described in verses 13 and 15. I can't be satisfied. I can't save enough. I can't accomplish enough to satisfy others for the rest of my life. It is a never, ever ending chase. So what do I do? 
What I need to do is counter that thinking with verse 9, with the Lord's voice. I need to cling to the truth that my value is based on being made in God's image. My value is based on being someone for whom Christ died. And those truths can never be taken away from me, no matter what I accomplish or don't. If I really believe that about myself, I will live differently. I will give resources instead of hoarding them. I will find better balance between my work and my family because my value isn't at stake in my work. I will delight in what God does through me, but I won't feel the need to take credit for it. That's the life of being fruitful, fruitful instead of futile. What is God doing in these verses? God is in a very important way actually removing from these people the very things that they are relying on that take them from him. It is, in the long run, a blessing, but it's a painful one. Micah's audience lived by their culture's advice. Enrich yourself at the expense of others. God's response is that that is only going to lead to a futile life, to the same futility that you are inflicting on others and that you are working so hard to avoid yourself. And so God says, I'm going to remove that from you, as painful as it will be. And that takes us to the point of the passage you find only futility when you fail to follow the Lord. There are so many things in our culture that call us to follow it that says we can tell you how to be successful and we can tell you what success is. We can tell you how to have a wonderful relationship and we will tell you what that wonderful relationship is. And I wonder if one of the reasons we are so quick to adopt our culture's thinking about what matters and what is acceptable for how to achieve it is because we desperately want the people around us to say, I accept you and I approve of you. And God is already saying to you, I love you enough to pursue you, even with my son who died so that you could know my love. We will never be good enough for that kind of love, but once you've experienced it, the voices in our culture that want to pull us away start to carry a lot less appeal. So how do we respond to this practically this week? Giving you four suggestions. Um, Again, want to encourage you on that handout that you got, that half sheet, quarter sheet, whatever that is, There's a place on there for you to indicate how you want to respond to this message or let us know any prayer requests that you have. There are boxes in the foyer on either side of the lobby that uh, you can put those in, and then we as a staff will pray for them. And here's some ways that, that we're suggesting. Again, every week we want to remind you to start in prayer. If all we did is say, try harder, work harder to be a better Christian, um, we would essentially be asking you to do something impossible. We have to start with the Lord's help. Pray that the Lord will reveal where you listen to the wrong voices, where it is that you listen to our culture and its understanding of what a good life is and its understanding of how to achieve it. Go through the discussion questions with someone. Study what these verses say about God that we might know him better. And take time to write down What are five different influences that are pulling you away from following the Lord? Five different things that are taking you away from the Lord's voice. Whether it's friends, something in your culture, something that's in your life that is a distraction for you, identify them so that you can start addressing them. We certainly want to pray with you as you go through this process. So we're going to close in prayer. And I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward. This prayer team is here. 
every week for the same purpose. We want to stand with you, pray with you, as you, see, as you seek to apply God's word to your life. As you are going through struggles, whatever they may be, allow us to stand with you and pray with you. And if you do not know the God who loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you, that you could be in relationship with him, we want to introduce him. So come forward and let us pray with you. Please join me as we pray. Father, we thank you so much that you call us together to come before you, to listen to your word, to engage with your word, even when sometimes your word is hard to hear. Even when we are confronted with passages where we are called out because, Lord, we do create futility in the lives of others, and we do cling to things other than you to give our life meaning and value that will only lead us to futility. But, Lord, we thank you that you bring those things to our attention, that we might better live with you. And, Lord, we thank you that you are actively at work to weed those things out. May we be good participants with you in that process. Lord, help us with that today and this week. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So here's your thought as you leave. Your God is actively at work in your life. He is not passive. Your God is at work to weed out from you the very things that will lead you to a life of futility. As painful as that is, leave here and know that it is a blessing that you get to participate in. You're dismissed.